Hello, this lecture will serve as an introduction to movement disorders. And we will be discussing not only Parkinson's disease, but also atypical Parkinsonism, including diseases like Lewy body dementia. And then we will start talking about choreiform diseases, including Huntington's disease, and then Tourette syndrome briefly, followed by dystonia, and finally, we'll try to classify tremors for better understanding. You re may remember this slide from neuroanatomy. This is basically our basal ganglia and how it's connected with the cortex. So movement disorders, they basically involve these circuits, and you can see those circuits with the arrows. And when you have damage anywhere within the circuit, you will develop either what we would call a hyperkinetic or hypokinetic movement disorder. Parkinson's disease, of course, would be a hypokinetic disorder compared to Huntington's, which is more hyperkinetic, for example. This is not something we would expect to, you would be, to be memorized like you had in neuroanatomy, but it's just good to develop a basic understanding of how movement disorders develop in the first place. So we'll start with Parkinson's disease. And of course, this has been uh, discovered for a fairly long time now, um, 300 years exactly. Uh, so the main hallmark that you really need to understand about Parkinson's, there's really three main symptoms. So that's rest tremor, rigidity, and we usually refer to that as cogwheel rigidity, and then finally bradykinesia or slowness of movement. And in order to diagnose someone with Parkinson's disease, you need to really have two out of those three uh, symptoms. So, and we usually refer to that as Parkinsonism if you have two out of those three. Um, another thing we look at often is gait. And Usually gait is a, uh, it's important factor as well, but not considered part of the core criteria. Now, most patients with Parkinson's are diagnosed over age 65, but we do see people below age 50 as well that are diagnosed. And of course, the pathology is related to degeneration of neurons in the substantia nigra. 90% is sporadic. We really don't know what the cause is been hypothesized to be related to mitochondrial dysfunction and inflammation, but that's really the, ex uh, the extent of what we understand. 10% is thought to be hereditary. This is actually fairly common with a lot of neurologic diseases such as MS and ALS are also in that 10% category of being thought to be hereditary. Uh, if the patient has a strong family history, there are various genetic tests that can be used uh, to make a diagnosis of hereditary Parkinson's disease. He displays, he displays coarse, coarse tremors, tremors an, expressionless an expressionless face, face flexed, flexed elbows, elbows, no arm swings, swings, and on block, block turning. turning. So in that particular video, this patient has fairly symmetric tremor in both hands. Uh, usually with Parkinson's, I would point out that often the tremor it starts unilaterally. That's one of the important key uh, symptomatology of Parkinson's is that it tends to be unilateral at onset, but as it gets more advanced, it usually will become bilateral as in this patient. Another key point is with his walking, uh, these patients tend to have difficulty with turns and you'll see that with the next video. This patient has advanced Parkinson disease with characteristic signs including bradykinesia, poverty of associated movements, shuffling gait, and on-block turning in small steps. Keep going. Good. Can you turn in the opposite direction now? She has frequent episodes of freezing, especially while turning. During these episodes, her toes flex, resembling a foot grasp, she improves markedly after botulinum toxin injections into the toe flexors and posterior tibialis. Uh, what did you notice after the injection with respect to your freezing? If you had to attach a percentage of improvement after the injection, how much improvement do you think you received from the injection? Okay, and that, you're talking mainly about the freezing, is that right? The freezing improved about 75 percent. And so again, you can see the problems with turns. And other symptoms with walking that you see, of course, with Parkinson's would include uh, not only stooped posture, uh, 
but also what we call retropulsion, which is when we do a pull test, when we pull a patient backwards, they have difficulty maintaining their posture and tend to keep going backwards. So one or two steps to maintain your balance is usually normal. More than two steps is abnormal. Other uh, problems with gait includes, include decreased arm swing on one side, usually the affected side, and also something called freezing and fenestration. So freezing is a huge problem with these patients. Uh, some people may suggest listening to marching music, let's say with an uh, iPod or iPhone or something like that may help uh, with stopping a freezing. No medications really are all that helpful. And then fenestration is also a very typical feature of Parkinson Parkinsonian gait. So there's a variety of medications that are used with Parkinson's. One key uh, point that's very important to understand, none of these medicines actually will help slow down the disease. So uh, they've studied a lot of different drugs to see if anything can help slow down Parkinson's. Unfortunately, nothing has been very effective for that. All these medicines are used for is really to treat the symptoms. The very best medication is levodopa or carbidopa levodopa, uh, and that's been around for probably over 50 years now. Um, it's unfortunate that's still the highest efficacy and also probably the best side effect profile of all these medications, so they have not really developed anything better than levodopa over the last 50 years. There are several problems with using levodopa, however, the Initially, when we start using it, we tend to start, let's say, carbidopa, levodopa, 25 over 100 milligrams three times a day, it tends to have a very steady state. However, as time goes on, patients tend to get this problem called on-off phenomenon, when as soon as they take the levodopa, they tend to have a marked improvement in their symptoms fairly soon, and then all of a sudden, the improvement stops. And so we call that on-off phenomenon. Very difficult for patients to deal with that problem. The second problem that this medication uh, will cause over a uh, longer period of time is they can get dyskinesias, which are dance-like movements, somewhat like chorea. Um, you may have seen uh, patients with Parkinson's who are on uh, carbidopa, levodopa, who develop this problem. And, um, and sometimes these are not bothersome to the patient. Sometimes they are very bothersome. They may be embarrassed by the movements or they can be painful. And so, and so for this reason, if the pa uh, patient is a little bit younger, as little relative minor, milder symptoms, we often will not start with levodopa so that we don't start the clock on any long-term side effects. The second most common, commonly used medication are dopamine agonists. This would include medications like primapaxol and ropinirol, uh, very uh, effective in Parkinson's disease. Uh, they do tend to have a little bit more in terms of side effects versus levodopa alone. Uh, one of the most uh, kind of well-known side effects at this point is that it can exacerbate certain obsessions such as pat causing pathologic gambling, for instance, or excessive shopping. Uh, so you have to be warn patients about that. Uh, they can cause more sleepiness and more difficulty with orthostatic hypotension and occasionally hallucinations. So uh, one of the benefits of these medications, though, in conjunction with levodopa, you can in um, increase the on-off on uh, or the on effect uh, with levodopa, so they work synergistically. MAO uh, inhibitors, this would include risagiline and selegiline, also very good drugs, not nearly as potent probably as levodopa and dopamine agonists, uh, but they do have a favorable side effect profile. You do have to be careful of mixing these drugs with other antidepressants and also with aged cheese, wine, etc. Um, these are good drugs to start if patient has mild symptoms or as add-on therapy to kind of enhance the effects of levodopa. Anticholinergics, the main one we use here is trihexafenadyl. Mainly this drug is used to help with Parkinsonian tremor that is difficult to control. Intacapone, the most common one here is a drug called Comptan. This is a drug that uh, often comes packaged with levodopa in a formulation called Stilevo. Uh, this uh, medication also can enhance the effect of levodopa and it's used with levodopa frequently to kind of increase the on time for the patient. Amantadine uh, is the same medication, of course, used to treat influenza. Uh, and the main benefit of this is if a patient is having dyskinesias from levodopa, it can help with the dyskinesias. And in most patients with Parkinson's disease, as long as they don't have cognitive dysfunction, often are candidates for deep brain stimulation. You want to demonstrate that they've responded to levodopa, but at this point, maybe they're 
ha not having quite as good an effect with levodopa or they're having a whole, uh, difficult time with dyskinesias. And that's at what point you may want to consider these patients for deep, deep brain stimulation. So those are our main treatments. Atypical Parkinson's disorders are also very important. Most movement disorder specialists will always be thinking if the patient has true idiopathic Parkinson's disease or has an atypical disorder. There's four main atypical Parkinson's disorders uh, that you should be familiar with. And we will go over the hallmarks of these diseases and try to differentiate those versus regular idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And that's PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy, cortical basal degeneration, multiple systems atrophy, and dementia with Lewy bodies. So the first one is progressive supranuclear palsy. Uh, and with, as with most of these atypical Parkinson's disorders, uh, they tend to be a little bit more in terms of uh, faster progression. Uh, more severe in symptoms, and, and these, med these diseases also do not respond nearly as well to levodopa. And so a lot of these patients, if, we're not, uh, if they don't respond well to levodopa, is a, when we start thinking they may have an atypical disorder, this is a characteristic with PSP. The big hallmark with PSP is that they have decreased vertical eye movements with up gaze and particularly down gaze as well. They also may have retrocollis, which is where their head and neck are been uh, kind of positioned backwards and very stiff, and these patients tend to have a very severe frontal ap uh, dementia as well, and fairly um, fairly quickly progressive. The last thing not mentioned here, as, but these patients also tend to have a lot of problem with falls uh, and very early in their disease onset. So if the patient has falls early, that might be a, this might be the disease they have versus re regular idiopathic Parkinson's. This 68-year-old woman has a 10-year history of progressive gait and balance impairment, bradykinesia, dysarthria, dysphagia, and complete ophthalmoplegia unresponsive to levodopa therapy. She displays retrocollis, a persistent backward rotation of the head, and dystonia and striatal deformities of the hands, worse on her right. She is able to follow a target normally to the right and left. But not up or down. Up, look up, look up. Okay, look down, look down, look down, look down. Okay. Now close your eyes real tight. And open them. She has yes. trouble opening her eyes on command. Look at the watch. Her vertical okay. eye movements are normal when the examiner moves her head up and down. That's good. Okay, fine. She walks in an unsteady manner with her feet wide apart, but she is able to pivot relatively normally on one foot while turning, and she does not assume the flexed posture of Parkinson's disease. The next atypical disorder is cortical basal degeneration. Uh, and this one also, like PSP, has a poor response to levodopa. The hallmark of this disease uh, is really the big one is apraxia. Apraxia means difficulty usually in performing a task. So a way we can test this would be such as asking the patient to flip a coin or use a pair of scissors, and they're unable to do that properly with their hands. You need to check both sides, though, because in this particular disease, symptoms are asymmetric, so you want to do right and left hand. A common example of a patient that may develop this may be a dentist who now is unable to use his tools, for example. Another typical symptom with this is pyramidal signs. Pyramidal signs are uh, equivalent to cortical spinal tract findings, such as hyperreflexia and uh, positive Babinski's. These patients also tend to have myoclonus. And the last really uh, important symptom of this disease is alien limb syndrome. Usually this is related to dysfunction in the parietal lobes and or uh, corpus callosum. Uh, this means that the patient basically has a limb that they're unable to control whatsoever. Uh, and very interesting if you ever get to see that in a patient. Unfortunately, this uh, this uh, 
disease does not respond very well to any sorts of treatments and also is very quickly progressive, like PSP. She can rise normally from the seated position, but stands with her feet wide apart and her legs extended. She makes rhythmic stepping movements in an effort to start walking, but her feet seem to be stuck to the ground. And this is a form of gait apraxia or magnetic gait, um, also very characteristic of cortical basal degeneration. Probably the most common atypical Parkinson's disorder is multiple systems atrophy, MSA. There's various subtypes of this disease as well. The key hallmark that's really important to remember about this is these patients have very early and severe autonomic involvement with their symptoms. This usually is manifest by severe orthostatic hypotension. In males, they may also have erectile dysfunction. Um, men and women also have problems with bladder incontinence with this disease. And it's the, the area of pathology usually in this case is the intermediate cell column and the spinal cord, which is most affected. Uh, patients with idiopathic or regular Parkinson's uh, disease also get autonomic problems as well, but it usually tends to be later in the disease. Uh, these patients also get myoclonus and um, more often have uh, problems with sleep, especially sleep apnea, respiratory stridor, and uh, and more problems with depression than a typical Parkinson's patient. They do respond a little bit to levodopa, but not nearly as robust as idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And this is a patient demonstrating significant strider. The last um, atypical Parkinsonian disorder that you guys probably have heard of in the past is dementia with Lewy bodies. Uh, these patients tend to have mild to moderate Parkinson's type symptoms such as rest tremor or rigidity, also have poor levodopa response. By its name, they usually have dementia as well, somewhat similar to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they do respond to anticholinergic uh, or uh, anticholiner, uh, anticholiner esterase inhibitors such as donepezil. Um, the big hallmark of this disease is visual hallucinations. It tends to be very early in the disease onset, um, and they tend to be very uh, disturbing to the patient. Um, these patients do wax and wane throughout the day with their symptoms, so at times they're much more alert, and other times they have decreased levels of alertness, and they do very, very horribly with antipsychotics, um, which is an important thing to remember. A key point is which antipsychotics can you use for hallucinations and Parkinsonian disorders, and those are really only two. So the first one is uh, cl uh, clozapine or clozaril, which um, of course has a risk of uh, a granulocytosis, um, and so in fact, a lot of uh, in order to prescribe it, you have to be on a special prescriber's list, and so that limits a lot of us in prescribing that particular medication. But it's probably the best in treating hallucinations in someone with Parkinson's type disorder. And the second one um, that we use much more often is quetiapine or, or Seroquel. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have quite as much antipsychotic effect as Clozer as, as Clozaril would. There is a newer medication um, that's recently been approved but, um, uh, for this problem as well, um, but it's uh, probably beyond the scope of this lecture at this time. Um, and then the other thing with Lewy body dementia, these patients tend to have REM sleep behavior disorder. We'll show a video of that with the next slide. Um, in fact, REM sleep behavior disorder can predate even regular idiopathic Parkinson's disease by several years. And so it's important to ask about. Typically, these patients um, have movements in sleep, in REM sleep, when the patient should not have any movements, and it tends to be very violent. Um, the nice thing is it's very treatable with a little bit of clonazepam. And this is a video of a patient in, with REM sleep behavior disorder. And if you do a sleep study in this kind of patient, you can see when they're in REM sleep. Um, and, and we also hook up EMG electrodes to these patients. Um, and so you can see the EMG movement, movement during REM uh, 
to uh, match where, while they're in REM sleep and make a diagnosis. So to review a, um, atypical Parkinsonism, these are red flags that may, may make you think that the patient has an atypical Parkinsonian disorder versus regular idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So a patient who is falling fairly early in the disease course, we usually think about ESP. All of these diseases tend to progress more rapidly than idiopathic Parkinson's. If you see pyramidal or cerebellar signs, that's where we think about multiple systems atrophy. Uh, another hallmark of that is autonomic dysfunction towards the end. Abnormal eye movements, usually with up and down gazes, PSP, and early dementia, visual hallucinations. You can see early dementia with all of these atypical disorders, and hallucinations are very particular for Lewy body dementia. Shifting gears, we'll talk about chorea. So chorea in Latin means to dance, um, and it's described as a rapid, irregular, jerky movement. It is involuntary. There are several uh, subtypes called athetosis, which is usually a distal type of writhing movement in the hands and feet, um, and then uh, usually associated with uh, cerebral palsy most often, and then bilismus, which is a more of a flailing type of movement, usually unilateral after a lesion in this contralateral subthalamic nucleus. So contrary to what many people think, Huntington's disease is not the most common cause of chorea. It's only 11%. In fact, the, um, the most common cause we actually believe is to be vascular, and it usually tends to be unilateral if it's vascular. Drug-induced chorea is also not uh, uncommon, particularly from Medications such as anti-epileptics and illegal drugs such as cocaine and crack. This is where the term crack dancing came into play. And then HIV and other uh, uh, diseases such as lupus, hyperthyroidism may also cause chorea as well. <laughs> but as Huntington's disease is often tested and important to be aware of, uh, we'll talk about that first. So uh, it is uh, typically associated with chorea, but it has a lot of other symptoms, including uh, Parkinsonian symptoms, such as bradykinesia and rigidity. And it also has uh, the big uh, uh, hallmark of Huntington's disease that we often will see is very early in the disease onset. They tend to have a lot of neuropsychiatric and cognitive disturbances. A lot of times we see these patients have severe depression, suicidal ideation. They're often found on psych wards because of uh, this disturbance, um, and they tend to have fairly significant frontal lobe dementia as well. Other symptoms may include dystonia, which we'll talk about later. How old are you now? While seated, he displays severe generalized chorea. And what's the main trouble that you're having? Dysarthria and arm and hand dystonia. Can you say today is a nice day? These movements become more apparent when his limbs are unrestrained while walking. His gait is broad based and is interrupted by choreiform and dystonic movements of the trunk and legs. Turn around and come back if you could. So that patient demonstrates not only chorea but some dystonia as well. Try to keep it out as much as you can. Try to hold it out. She has impersistence of tongue protrusion, generalized chorea, and hung up pendular knee jerks. Persistence, there is a hallmark of frontal lobe diseases. So Huntington's disease, of course, is autosomal dominant. Um, usually symptoms start in the mid-40s to uh, early 50s in many patients. And, of course, it's associated with uh, CAG repeat, uh, and the length of the repeat is related to the severity. It does have anticipation, meaning that in successive de generations it may have uh, 
earlier and worse disease uh, symptomatology. The next type of uh, chorea that's very important to know is Sydenham's chorea, um, which of course uh, is a manifestation often after rheumatic fever. Um, and it's thought to be an autoimmune attack in the basal ganglia. The good news about this disease is it does have a fairly good prognosis long term, often does not require much therapy. If it may also reactivate later in life, and we call that in, in, during pregnancy, and we call that chorea gravidarum. And how you would test for this, of course, is you can measure and um, confirm the dis disorder is with ASO titers. This boy this has boy a two-month two history, history of left, left hemichorea, which developed, which developed after, after an acute, acute sore throat, throat and, was and was associated with elevated, with elevated ASO, ASO titers. titers. He, displays he displays prominent, prominent piano-playing piano movements, movements of his left, left hand. hand. As we stated earlier, vascular chorea is probably one of the most common forms of chorea. It usually occurs, let's say, after a stroke. Sometimes it may occur several months after the stroke and after, when we see them in outpatient follow-up. This is also has a fairly good long-term prognosis uh, and tends to get better with time. Um, if we do need to treat vascular chorea, we treat it like all other forms of chorea, and it's usually with dopamine blockers. So haloperidol, for example, is very effective. One of the most common drugs we use now for chorea is tetrabenazine. As we talked about before, drug-induced chorea, including antiepileptics mentioned on the slide here, um, levodopa can cause dyskinesia, which is similar to chorea, and then we talked about illegal drugs also. And you can't fall asleep because it's moving all the time? Yeah. Do you have pain anywhere? In your hand? And your shoulder? This young woman has cerebral palsy with generalized athetosis that causes pain in her joints and impairs her speech. It's hard. Okay. That's fine. You want to teach at the college level? Unfortunately, uh, athetosis like this, which is writhing movements, usually distally in the hands and feet, is very difficult to treat. Very common in patients with severe forms of cerebral palsy. Um, you can use dopamine blockers, just like in Korea, and often they'll refer to Korea actually as chorioathetosis, uh, so they're often linked together. This woman presented with a two-month history of left hemibolism following an acute infarction in the right subthalamic nucleus. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Tourette syndrome. So uh, uh, Tourette syndrome actually could be found in your DSM uh, for psychiatry, uh, but it's also very important to review. So Tourette's, of course, is de defined by a tic disorder, uh, and tics similar to chorea are uh, involuntary movements. So uh, both tics and chorea are both involuntary. Um, the difference, though, is that uh, Korea tends to be much more random, purposeless movement, while tics are very stereotyped. Uh, tics can have different manifestations. You may have motor tics uh, or uh, uh, phonic tics, such as uh, uh, someone making a uh, noise with their mouth, like a <coughs> sound such as that, may represent a tic. Coprololia is not a very common. Less than 10% of all tics are associated with this. Um, and most of these patients are uh, fairly young in adolescence, and the good news is they tend to outgrow the disorder. It is associated with OCD and ADHD. Um, and the biggest problem, and when you have to treat the tics, is if the tics are, um, can be very embarrassing for the patient or if they may um, actually injure themselves from the tic. Um, and we'll see a video with that here in, in a little bit.
medications used to uh, treat trick or uh, treat ticks. Um, there's various types, so um, medications such as clonidine uh, may be effective. Uh, do, uh, dopamine blockers also are used as well, um, and so there there are a variety of medications. And uh, and you just have to manage the side effects of the medications versus uh, the symptoms themselves. Well, um, my cornea ruptured and it ruptured because um, I poked on my eye, uh, on my left eye enough and for over a year. And I poked on it hard enough that it pinned out the cornea and it ruptured. That's why I'm wearing the patch. Okay. So describe the feeling for me that you have before you actually poke your eye. Um, it's sort of like an urge to poke it and I can't control it. So it's like, you know, if I poke my eye, then it satisfies the urge. Now, what do you do with this um, ball that you have in your hand? Well, I had this stress ball, so I won't poke my other eye. So I won't poke this eye. I do that sometimes, but it just helps it out so I don't. So if I have the urge to poke it, I just put my finger in it, or I just squeeze it. So obviously in this type of patient who's uh, injuring herself, you would want to treat the patient with medication. Uh, and let's talk a little bit about dystonia. So a lot of people um, who have not heard or do not know exactly how to define dystonia, the key point here is it's a sustained muscle contraction. It's usually associated with the patient holding abnormal postures such as a head tilt, etc. Here's a video with a patient with typical classic dystonia. This young man with cervical dystonia has torticollis affecting the right sternocleidomastoid muscle, producing hypertrophy of the muscle and head rotation to the left. Overall, would you say uh, if you had to attach a percentage of improvement since uh, the first injection, what would you say? I'd say 80%, 85%. Okay. And so that is a focal type of dystonia. Probably the most common type of dystonia is torticollis. And very treatable with uh, Botox. We uh, also classify dystonia as an interesting classification as young dystonia, which is usually less than age 26. And um, adult dystonia, which is older than age 26. I'm not sure why 26 is the, the uh, age there. And there's different types. So torticollis is the uh, most common type of focal dystonia. You could also have writer's cramp also as a form of focal dystonia, uh, for example. And then you get into more generalized forms of dystonia as well. Some of these are genetic disorders or uh, parts of other diseases such as Huntington's disease or Wilson's disease. Even patients with Parkinson's disease can get dystonia, let's say, with, uh, in, in their feet, where their feet is kind of pointing inward, for example. And so you can differentiate if it's a primary dystonia or a secondary dystonia. Childhood onset usually uh, is more of a generalized form of dystonia. It usually begins in the lower extremities. The most common form of this is the DYT1 form of dystonia. And then uh, that one, unfortunately, does not have great treatment. It's generalized, and those patients often are required to have deep brain stimulation. The second type of dystonia is levodopa, responsive dystonia. This is the exact opposite. This is very treatable with levodopa. In fact, it's basically a cure in these type of patients. And so any child who presents with symptoms of dystonia should be given a trial of levodopa to see if they have this form of dystonia. In adults, it's more often focal, such as torticollis, for example. Um, there are, uh, as mentioned above, it can be part of other diseases such as Huntington's disease. And if it's inherited, it may be autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive. DYT1 has uh, more than 10 to 15 different subtypes. And so there is genetic testing available for these types of dystonia. It is also associated with some of the atypical Parkinsonian disorders as well. And, and we mentioned before that often is associated with abnormal postures. It can also be with different forms of activity. Patients may manifest with uh, pain, such as uh, neck spasms, for instance. This is very common with torticollis. Uh, 
It is also often involuntary, but it is much more sustained of a movement. These patients may respond to sensory tricks uh, as well. How old are you? Okay, can you open your uh, left hand? Try to open that uh, fist. Okay, turn around. Contortion of the foot in this form of dystonia. This patient also had dystonia in her voice as well as spasmodic dysphonia. Um, and, uh, she had a particular genetic disorder called Halvorian Spots Syndrome. And so there are a variety of rare genetic diseases that can present with dystonia. Even patients with cerebral palsy may have dystonia as well. Um, these are all examples of symptoms that may actually be dystonia. Um, and so we talked about spasmodic dys uh, dysphonia. Um, patients who kind of close their eyes excessively, uh, that's called blepharospasm. You may have heard of that before. Um, and then the last one, even tremors are, can be a form of dystonia. Um, and so, and they often are very similar to Parkinsonian tremors and can be hard to differentiate. The treatment, first, uh, we always start with medications. Um, anticholinergics such as trihexafenadyl may be effective. Uh, they do have side effects of uh, cognitive dysfunction in older patients. GABAergic medications such as baclofen may also be effective. And then in um, patients who have levodopa responsive dystonia, levodopa is also effective. If, that, those, if the drugs are not adequate, then we usually try Botox, especially if it's a focal dystonia. If it's more generalized, these patients may qualify for deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation really has three main diseases for treatment, Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, which we'll talk about later, and then dystonia. So, Finally, we're going to talk a little bit about tremor. Um, and then uh, in talking about tremor, which is a very common symptom, we want to try to classify the tremor. And in classifying the tremor, we usually use three different Types is a, uh, is a tremor at rest or with action, and if it's in action, is it more in what we call a postural phase or with movement, which is a kinetic tremor. Um, so these are the different types of tremor that we usually deal with. A physiologic tremor, such as let's say from drinking a lot of caffeine, it's very fast, 8 to 12 hertz. So the frequency is important because you can tell by looking at the tremor often which type of tremor it is. So physiologic tremors tend to be the fastest tremors usually not at rest, but more with action or in posture. Essential tremors, which are fairly well known, vary a lot with their frequency. Um, these are usually most prominent in the postural phase and also, of course, with action as well. You may see them in advanced stages at rest, but usually not early on. Um, dystonic and Parkinsonian tremors, you may notice, are at basically the same frequency, and that makes it difficult sometimes to differentiate. Dystonic tremors are more prominent in the movement phase versus Parkinson's, which are, of course, at rest. Um, Parkinson's tremors actually tend to get better when you, with movement, um, and those are 4 to 6 hertz. Uh, cerebellar and Holmes tremors are the slowest type of tremor, uh, very slow, um, also very difficult to treat, and also can be seen in basically all three phases. Um, cerebellar tremor is most often seen with movement as well. We often will refer to this as an intention tremor, for instance. Essential tremor is very important to recognize, uh, commonly tested. Um, it tends to be bilateral, usually seen in the hands, um, sometimes in the voice as well. These patients do not have other abnormal neurological features, such as upcoming toes, hyperreflexia, etc. They also tend not to have other Parkinson's symptoms, such as bradykinesia or cogwheel rigidity. Um, one thing that people often will misdiagnose is a patient who has a head tremor, just isolated to the head often is diagnosed as a central tremor, but that usually is actually more often a, a, a part of dystonia and often cervical dystonia is something to keep in mind. 
Um, the big thing with essential tremor also, it tends to be slowly progressive. It doesn't start all of a sudden, for instance, um, and patients often will have a family history. Um, they do um, often say if they drink uh, alcohol that they, it gets better with alcohol, particularly red wine. This woman this exhibits woman a coarse postural, postural tremor, tremor affecting, affecting both arms, arms and head. And the, tremor the tremor persists, persists during, during finger-to-nose finger -to -nose testing. testing. She spills water when pouring it from one cup into another and draws an irregular Archimedean spiral. With left thalamic deep brain stimulation, she displays no tremor with the arms outstretched and develops only a left-sided tremor as her hands approach her face. She pours water and draws a spiral normally. So deep brain stimulation can be very effective for these types of tremors, especially if they do not respond to medications. We'll talk about the medications here in a little bit. Um, I, uh, in the office, checking out patients and how they do spirals is a nice way to really assess how their tremor is doing. So very easy to do. It takes about 20 seconds, really. In terms of uh, essential tremor, red flags, things that might make you think something else might be going on. If it's involving the legs, if you see Parkinsonian features, walking problems. If it's just in the head, you might want to think of dystonia. If it's just on one side, it may more likely be dystonia as well. If it starts all of a sudden, it may be either medication or psychogenic uh, is usually what we think about. The treatment, there's really two drugs that are really, really effective. It's the first two mentioned there, primidone and propranolol. Um, so those two are usually our first line medications. Um, really can't say one is better than the other. Um, in older patients, we may not use propranolol quite as much because of risk of orthostasis. Um, alcohol is not a treatment, but it, again, may be used uh, for diagnosis. Third and fourth line agents may, especially if the patient does not want to consider surgery, would be benzodiazepines or tro tropiramate. Surgically, uh, DBS is very effective. Usually, uh, if the patient is, let's say, right-handed, we may only do one side, the contralateral side, um, and it's usually performed in the thalamus itself, but a very effective treatment. Um, more recently, there's been some literature published that they can do ultrasound-type ablation um, in the thalamus as well, um, but it's uh, unclear right now if that's clinically useful because there is a risk of hemiparesis and things of that sort with, uh, with that kind of treatment. So. But that, that's something new that was recently published in New England Journal of Medicine, actually. Cerebellar tremors um, tend to be uh, another name for this usually is an intention tremor. They tend to be very proximal, very slow, uh, usually not seen uh, quite as much at rest, but more often with movement, um, often associated with multiple sclerosis, actually. We may see this with other uh, cerebellar diseases such as tumors, etc., but most often we see this with uh, multiple sclerosis. Unfortunately, there's no uh, excellent treatments uh, for these type of tremors. They are fairly uncommon. Um, we may use similar drugs such as uh, benzodiazepines and propranolol uh, to see if that may be effective. Uh, there were trials with deep brain stimulation. However, it's not FDA approved. Uh, the, the DBS is not FDA approved for cerebellar tremors. For completion's sake, we will also briefly discuss a Holmes tremor. Holmes tremor is a really related to a lesion in the midbrain. It's often called a ruval tremor as it's near the red nucleus. Um, you, most often it's seen after a, a stroke involving the midbrain. It usually involves the proximal muscles and is seen in all three phases. Unfortunately, there's no really good treatment for a Holmes tremor. This man with Benedict, Benedict syndrome, syndrome shows, shows complete, complete ptosis. ptosis and slow rest, postural, and kinetic tremor of his left hand. Very important to recognize that a lot of medications can cause or worsen tremor, so you want to always look at medications when talking about tremor. Uh, 
Um, one of, some of the ones I'll point out here, uh, corticosteroids, caffeine, of course, um, also uh, beta adrenergic agonists such as, let's say, albuterol inhalers can precipitate tremor, so you want to look at all the medications. Neuroleptics, of course, can cause a Parkinsonian syndrome and certainly can contribute to tremor. There's a second slide with uh, drugs that can cause tremor. The one I'll point out here is valproic acid, very common um, uh, as well. Uh, and if it's not shown here, lithium is another drug that can also precipitate a tremor. And finally, we'll briefly talk about psychogenic tremor. These tend to be much more sudden onset. And the key thing here is they tend to be very irregular and variable in frequency. So when you watch the patient, the frequency varies quite often, and that's usually how you can clearly diagnose the psychogenic tremor. Um, and so just to be aware of that, as these are very common. And that will end our presentation today.